Well, welcome. It's good to see everybody this morning. A beautiful day to come to church, right? Yes. Sunshine, all that good stuff. Um, I am continuing Pastor uh, Tom's uh, series on faith that works, um, or faith works. And um, I am uh, got the verses, uh, James chapter 1, verses 22 to 25. So that's what we're going to be working on this morning. The title of the message is, Become a doer of the word. Actually, it sh- I, 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 I sent that off to the media team before I wanted to change it. should be becoming a doer of the word. And uh, we'll talk about that as we get in it. But that should be the title. So if you have the notes and you like to rewrite things down, uh, the title really is Becoming a Doer of the Word. So let's get into the scripture. Uh, James chapter 1, verses 22 to 26. I mean 25. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man He was, but he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in all that he does. Heavenly Father, right now we just submit to you, we submit to your word, we submit right now to the presence of the Holy Spirit, Father, for his purpose here right now is to open our eyes, to open our ears and to open our hearts so that we can see, hear, and understand. Father, we receive that all now in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. So when we look at James uh, chapter 1, verses 22 to 25, I see three things out of that chapter. I see an instruction. I see a reason for the instruction. And then I see the result of the instruction. Those are the three things that I see when I look at that little passage. So the instruction, the reason for the instruction, and then the result of the instruction. Simple. It's just so simple. So easy to do, nothing complex. And, um, but that's what you'll see in these four verses. Let's talk about the instruction. I'll go through these three premises, and then I will give my conclusion at the end of those. The instruction is, become a doer of the word, Not here is only being self-deceived. Okay? So that's the instruction. Become a doer of the word. Not here is only being self-deceived. James is an interesting book. Um, Martin Luther, the uh, great reformer who is a champion for starting the Lutheran faith, actually wanted to take James out of the canon. (laughs) He didn't like it because he thought it fought with the way Paul was teaching how we received our salvation. Because Paul says, our salvation is not of works, but of faith. And then James comes around and starts writing, hey, uh, you got to be a doer of the word. He's actually, if you think about James, what do you hear most of it is faith without works is dead. Right? So he didn't do that. He, he just talked about how he'd like to do that because he couldn't balance the two at that time with what he has. Thank God the Holy Spirit's been working on the church over these centuries and given us better understanding on how this all fits. So we'll be talking about this morning. So it is James's first attempt of connecting his overall statement in James, faith without works is dead, So he starts off here in this first chapter saying, be doers of the word. Be a doer. The word doer is a noun. It's actually the word poet. It doesn't make sense, so they they found a different word. It actually says, be a poet of the word or performer of the word. You know, the guy who did the Passion Translation, he caught a hold of that. He says it this way. Don't just listen to the word of truth and not respond to it. For that is the essence of self-deception. 
So always let the word become like poetry written and fulfilled by your life. Let the word become like poetry. Something God's writing a poem. I think, I think Paul said something like that, didn't he? In first, uh, 2 Corinthians 3, he said, Clearly, you are an epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh. That is of the heart. And I, I apologize to the media team. They did not get that scripture ahead of time. I don't know if they jumped on that or not. But Paul says we're written epistles. So I guess the overall question is, what translation are you? What translation are people reading as they see you interact with them on a daily basis? What is the poem that you're allowing God to create in you when we get into the Word? So what translation are you? James could be connecting with his, his older brother. That would be Jesus, by the way. And uh, what he taught, he said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter in the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. So I'm sure James was taking that as uh, an urgent message in the understanding of our walk as a believer. So keep all that in mind. But before we go further down the list, we have to go backwards one verse. I think verse 21 is very important in the study of verse 22, which says, Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. So, receive with meekness the implanted word or the inborn word. Receive that. So, as you're doing it. So, what's he talking about there? Well, he's talking about hearing. So, James isn't, he's not telling us not to be hearers of the word. He's telling us not to be hearers only. Because hearing is a very vital part of our growth as believers in Christ. Because faith comes by what? <laughs> there you go. So it's a very important part. So we're not canceling out hearing. But the propensity of the human being, not just today because of all of our podcasts and all of our YouTubes and all the different ways we can hear messages over and over and over again, the propensity of the human being is to hear only. Just to hear. I went to church, I listened, I'm good. And James is just encouraging us, no, it takes one more step. Become a doer of the word. Become a doer. So in Romans, um, it says, How shall they call on him who, in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him who they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? So faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And Peter says, having been born again, in 1 Peter uh, 1.23, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abide forever. So we've been born, we've received that inborn word. So we heard the word, and at, you know what? Every, by the way, every one of you in this, world, in this room right now, this morning's a doer. The first thing it is, you did something, you came to church today which was obeying the word of God that says not to forsake the assembling of yourselves together, guess what? You're a doer. Someone say amen. <laughs> Woo. Okay, we, we get that off the table. We're doing good. Okay, and any of you, how many of you just love Jesus and Jesus is your Lord and Savior? Amen. 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 You're a doer. Hello. Because what? You heard the gospel, and guess what did you do? You said, Jesus, be Lord of my life. You confessed him. And you became a doer. But when James is talking about becoming a doer, in the verbiage, it actually is saying, keep on becoming. 
a doer. Don't just stop at one level. Keep on becoming a doer. That's what the word be actually means. Keep on becoming. Become. Keep on becoming a doer of the word. And my ear thing is coming off. I apologize. I'm a newbie at all this stuff. Okay. There we go. So you get to be... You get to keep on becoming a doer of the word. You can't stop and say, hey, I, uh, I, I became, I, I was a doer. I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord. Well, there's more to it than that. And so we keep on becoming. So that's the instruction. And the war- warning that goes with the instruction is, if you're here only, only you're going to fall into self-deception. You're going to think you're okay when you're not okay. You're going to think life's fine and there might need to be a correction. How many people realize that you've been in a situation, just in a relationship, maybe with your spouse or other family members, you thought everything was going okay and all of a sudden you discovered that it's not. And that's happening when you're not being a doer. You discover that. I mean, that's what happens. You get self-deceived. Even in a relationship, a marriage relationship, when you're not practicing love with each other you can think everything's okay but the other person's miserable because you're not doing you're not investing you're not actively participating in that that relation does that make sense you see how that works okay so that's all god's doing he's telling us here to become a not just a hearer we've got to hear the hearing is how faith is revealed into our heart we get faith you hear the word of god it's revealed and then god says another step now do something with what you've heard okay figure out how to do that do something and start stepping i don't know what to step lord step anyway i don't know where to step just step forward do something and let that faith do something and you'll be surprised what becomes revealed as you do so Young's literal, transla- literal translation says, and become doers of the word. So that's a translation that pops that up. God doesn't ask anything of us until we become his child, but once we become his child, then he asks us to keep on becoming a doer. Now I know why this is coming off. I like to, you know, I, I, I like to, you know, they say if you take off your glasses and do this, you own the room. <laughs> so I like to... I like to take my glasses off. I'm used to doing that. And then it's knocking this thing off my ear. Oh, jeepers. Okay. Now it's upside down. Okay. And if anything, I'm always entertaining. Okay? All right. So we'll we'll do... (laughs) Yeah. Not merely do the word, but be becoming doers of the word is one of the um, James Fawcett... uh, Translation, uh, not translation, but commentary says. Job says, I've treasured your word in my mouth more than my necessary wor- uh, food. That means it's a part of your daily activities. You're doing it. It's, it, it. You're not just hearing the word. In other words, you've got this plate of food, and boy, it smells good, it tastes good. I mean, it, it looks good and everything, but you're not eating it. Doing the word is now partaking of it. And letting it transform your life. So, so not to become sermon sippers, right? We just don't want to be sermon sippers. Podcast to podcast to podcast to podcast to podcast, which are fine. I, 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 I listen to podcasts. I do that. But you have to take what's in, in, in heart, and it's got to become something that starts activating in your life is doing it. Now, sometimes we're taught that you've got to just do it to make it more real. I have a little bit different philosophy on that, and we'll go through as we uh, get to the end of this. And when you're doing the word, if you're, if you're doing that stepping out, that is help preventing self-deception. So hearing is necessary, but doing is the second clause. I think we've gotten that. You got that first instruction down good? All right. Next part is the reason for this instruction. Why is it self-deception if you're not doing the word as well? Well, the reason is hearers only, if you're a hearer only, if you're hearers only, you forget who you are in Christ. If you're just listening to the word and not doing something about it, 
you forget who you are. You're going to forget what God's done in your life. You're just hearing. It's not going to stay put. In James 23 and 24, it says, in chapter 1, verse 23 and 24, For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his face in a, in a mirror, his natural face in a mirror, for he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. Was when? Was when you're looking in the Word. So as you're looking into the Word, it's revealing you, revealing to you who you are. Now, it's either revealing correction. That's one thing it could be revealing, right? Everyone say amen. Because I know you're all people who love correction, right? And you just wake up in the morning and you can't wait for a correction from God. Yippee! God, tell me I'm doing something wrong. So I, you know, in one sense, that's a good thing because then you can make it right, right? But that's not the only thing. How many of you would have loved to live in a family where all you heard from mom and dad was everything you were doing wrong? So that's not the way God's planned it. Some of us had, did grow up in those types of homes, and there are things we have to deal with now because of it. That's not God's plan. God's more interested in showing you who you are than who you are not. Because once you discover who you are, then you become it. Right believing produces right living. So you got to believe first. You got to hear. You got to hear the right things. You got to be looking into the word of God to find out who you are. And then you got to let that transform your life because we are transformed by the renewing of our mind. You let the word of God come in as the implanted word. You let it renew your mind and it transform you, transforms you to live in that direction. Right believing produces right living. And so you need to do that. So if you're not doing the word, though, then you'll forget God's love for you. You're going to forget it. And when something bad comes up to your life, you're going to say, hey, why don't you love me? If you're not doing the word, you're going to forget what Jesus accomplished through his sacrifice at Calvary. You're going to forget what the Holy Spirit is to you and what's he doing, what, what, what is he doing in your life right now. You're going to forget about loving one another for sure. Because we're all narcissistic, just say amen. We, 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 we want everybody doing stuff for us. That's the natural bent we are. Even if you think you're a natural bent of being a server, others, I guarantee you, you, you got that way because of God. It's not your natural bent, that's your God bent. If you're serving other people and you know you are and you're doing well at it, that's a God bent. God bent you that way. Okay? But our natural bent, our humanity, why we needed Jesus in the first place is because we are self-centered. And as soon as we admit that, we can go on and grow. So, if you're, not, if you're here only, we will tend to forget who we are and what we've learned in the Word, what we've heard. How many of us, and, and, and just, I've been there, so just think of this. You, you've, you've been to church, you listen to the message, go away, an hour later, someone says, well, what was church about? Can't answer it, you forgot it, and guess what? It's not doing anything in one sense. And I've been there dozens of times. And that you have to, on purpose, do something about it. There's an old proverb that kind of works with this. It's, it's a Jewish proverb about going to the Jew, uh, uh, synagogue. It says, uh, there are four men who visit the synagogue. Four kinds of men who visit the synagogue. He who enters but does not work. He who works but does not enter. He who enters and works. And he who neither enters or works. So that, was, uh, that came out of uh, um, a Jewish believer in his commentary on this, on this section. 
He's a, he's a Christian, but he's a Jew. He was a, he was a, um, a rabbi who got saved, and he was writing a commentary on this section, and he brought that out here. So I thought that was pretty interesting. So he who enters but does not work, he who works but does not enter, he who enters and works, and he who neither enters nor works. Four kinds of people. It kind of goes right with the aspect of what Jesus said, there's four kinds of soil. You know, in his, the sower sows the word, the, the word is sown on the path, among the rocks, among the thorns, okay, or in the good soil. So if, we, we need to, if you want to remember who you are in Christ, it does require that wonderful word called doing. can't be just hearing. There's got to be a way that it's applied in your life. But the results. Now let's talk about the results. So we've talked about the instruction and the reason for the instruction. And now for the results is if you're a doer of the work, you are blessed in whatever you do. So... The doer of the work is blessed in whatever he does. That is the result of doing. Now, I don't know about you, but that's a good result. That's like going into an investment firm and saying, hey, I want to look into this investment, and they say, you know what? You get 100% on that one. Are you going to walk away not investing in it once you prove that he's not lying to you and it's the truth? That your return is going to be 100% plus more? more? Now, I'm not an investor. If that didn't make sense to any of you, then I'm, I'm not an investor that much, so I don't know if I said it right. I'm trusting I might have. But if you get a good return, the better the return. Just think of the best return you could ever get. Would you turn it down? Here, you're getting 100%. If you're a doer of the work, you'll be blessed in whatever you do. That's the result of the instruction. So he who looks, let's look at the verse now, he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in whatever he does or in what he does. So let's take that verse apart just a little bit. The phrase look into means to stoop down and take a second look intently, deeply. Take a closer look. So we're supposed to take a closer look into the Word of God. Hmm, what's that look like? That might look like a different, it might look different to different people. Are you looking, stooping down, looking into the, the Word of God when you go for it? As human beings, we so often bring our own agenda into the Word. But to look down, stoop into the Word without our agenda and just receive from God. Probably a wise step. The law of liberty here, so we're looking into, we're stooping down, looking into the perfect law of liberty. That law is the New, new Testament, the new, the new Testament side of things. It's the royal law of love. Looking into the love of, the command of God's love. The church is really one command, and that's, we're, 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 we have a greater command. I hope you, if you take anything away, I think this is worth it. We have a greater command than to love your neighbor as yourself. We have a greater command than that. That command is, Jesus said to the disciples, love one another as I have loved you. That's a greater command. To love others as Christ loves us. That's a great command in all levels. To love others as Christ has. Talk about doing. So we're looking into the perfect law of liberty because we want to find out who we are so I can walk that way. So I can do what God's asked me to do. I can work on that. I can try it. I can I can fail dozens of times, but God allows me to get up and try again, over and over again. There are no second chances with God. There's hundreds of chances with God. It's not limited to two. Hundreds of chances. We know at least 490 chances in a day. That's what he told Peter, 70 times 7, that's 490. 
I haven't reached 490 in a day yet. I think I can say that. Now, I won't ask Jane, my wife, but I'm pretty confident that it's uh, not 490 yet on a daily basis. But God says, that's what I'm going to give you. So this doing thing is not a perfect thing. It doesn't say, it doesn't say, do the word. It doesn't say that. It says, become a doer. Or becoming a doer is a better way. Continually become a doer of the word. All the time. That means tonight at the end of the day and you're thinking about the day and you had some mess ups, guess what? Tomorrow morning there's a whole pile of mercies for you. The grace of God is fresh and new and you get to start all over and try again. Somebody say amen besides Roger. <laughs> all right. <laughs> so there we are, good. So that, was, that brings me to where we now are going to talk about, this is where I wanted to get to. We've heard this, these verses a lot, so I didn't need to sit and hone on every one of them because I want to talk about the conclusion, something that I see that's important and how we understand how we become this doer of the word. Um, it starts with what Jesus shares in Mark 4 about the parable of the seed. And I'd like to say it like this. Well, what does a doer look like? The kingdom of God is as if a man should scattered seed on a ground. So we're going to take you to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4 has a whole list of um, uh, parables that Jesus starts off. And in, in, in the beginning of 4, it's actually where Jesus says the sower sows the word. And then he says, you know, some of the seed uh, falls in the path some among rocks, some among thorns, and some on good ground, okay? And generally speaking, that's kind of like a uh, evangelistic type message there. It's talking about how we spread the word of God out into the community. It's, it's going to fall on path. It's going to fall on the path for some. Some are going to be a path hard, and the enemy is going to come and take the word away right away. Some people are going to have difficulty. They believe in the word, but they're going to have struggles with it. And then there's going to be some good ground that produces. So we're going to see a bunch of different types of people out there when we're out going into the community and trying to uh, spread the gospel. But Jesus repeats this a little bit differently down in verse 26 of Mark 4, 26. He says, The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground and should not sleep by night, uh, and should sleep, not, and should sleep by night, I was talking about myself. I didn't sleep very well last night, so I was... But anyway, I should sleep by night and rise by day, and the seed should sprout and grow. He himself does not know how. Oh, I love that. I'll come back to that in a moment. For the earth yields crops by itself, first the blade, then the head, and after the full grain in the head, but when the grain is ripens, immediately he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. The first parable in Mark, I believe, is more evangelistic. What happens when we spread the word of God out in the community? What should we expect? Where well, we're going to have four responses. Okay, pretty much. Here, this is a personal parable for each one of us. This is now a principle of the kingdom of God. And Jesus is teaching us what happens when you sow the word in your own heart. So the seed still is the word of God. We're still in the same chapter. And Jesus says, if you can't understand this first one, you're not going to stand, understand the rest ones that I, I just get telling you. But so we know the seed here is the word of God. The man now is any one of you in here. And the ground is your own heart. So if you're sowing the seed, into your own heart. Now, if we go back to James, that's hearing the word. You're sowing the word into your own heart. You're listening to the word, and you're gathering the seed and sowing it into your own heart. Now, what do we ex what's the next thing that happens? 
Well, you go to sleep. In other words, you do nothing. I heard one man call this effortless, effortless change. And when he said that, that spoke volumes to my heart because what I discovered in, uh, back in uh, 2014 was when I would learn, uh, God got me back. Some of you know my testimony, and I, I, I won't take the time to go through the whole thing here at this point, but um, I learned to get back into the presence of God and just sit and rest. I'm a student of the word. I go into it, I take it apart, I look at what the Greek is, the Hebrew is. That's just how I'm bent. I look at hundreds of different commentators, see what they all have to say, and half of them I yell at and say, you guys are idiots. And, you know, and, and no, I don't. But, I, and some people are saying that I am right now as they're listening to me, so I'm right back, as, you know. Goes, you got to remember that uh, anytime you point a finger, you're three times guilty, right? Okay, you know what that means, right? You're three times guilty. You got three fingers coming back at you. Anytime you point it, you're three times guilty. Okay, so anytime I say anybody else is an idiot, guess what? I'm three times the idiot for even saying that or even thinking it. But anyway, um, so here we have the seed is God's word. The heart, the ground is your heart. The sowing is putting it in. We know that's the hearing part of it. But what's the doing in here? Because it says here the doing in one sense. You've got to listen to this very carefully. The doing is sleeping by night and rise by day. We've got to think about that. Then it says, what happens, you know, if you were to take a seed, you can test this out and see if I'm telling you the truth. Just take any seed, go to one of the stores, buy a pack of seeds, put a seed in a little cup with, with dirt in it and everything else, put it in the sunlight. But every day you go, every day you dig up that seed and take it out and bury it again. Every day you take up that seed and put it back in. Every day you take up that seed and put it back in you're not going to get good results with that seed. Can you agree with that? What do you have to do? Leave it alone. Sow it and leave it alone. Go to bed, rest in the Lord. Sleep by night and then rise by day. And then do, just get your day going. Do your day trusting in the next part. What's the next part? That that seed you sown is going to start growing. It's going to first be a blade. Then it's going to be a head. After that, a full grain in the head. And when it finally ripens, then you get a harvest or a blessing in what you've been doing. You just go and try and put the things together. Don't worry about it. Don't fret over it. Go to rest at night. You wake up in the morning. You go to your job. And you start applying the love of God the best way you know how. Just start loving others. And as you just start loving others, it starts growing. First, it's just a little blade. Then it starts getting bigger and bigger. And eventually, a blessing shows up as a result of it. I shared this morning in the, my Sunday school class of um, a, a situation that I had in one of the jobs I've had where I uh, started a job that um, um, it started off being very difficult. The job did. Not only did the job, was it difficult, not what I was expecting. I was put next to another person who made the job 100 times worse. Okay? Our personalities did not work together. Everything else just did not work together. And um, I... The, six, the first six weeks of the job was, you know, H-E double L toothpicks, whatever that is, okay? It was, yeah, bad. It was bad. It, I did not want to continue working there. I, 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 I talked with my wife. I said, we've got to find something else. I don't know what else to do. But then I had to remember who I was. 
than what I was called to. This morning in my Sunday school class, we were just looking at Romans chapter 12. In the latter part of the, uh, part of the verse, it says, let your love be without hypocrisy. In other words, you love without expecting to be loved back. Husbands and wives, try that at home. Love one another without trying to expect to be loved back. Let your love be without hypocrisy. And give place to people's wrath or their, or their, or their bugginess to you, whatever that is. Give place to someone just irritating you to no end. And love them back. Bless them who curse you. Right? Bless and not curse. Feed the person who's... Uh, feed your enemy, right? Give them water if they're thirsty. God's simply telling them us to love them without any expectation back. And when you do what you do is you open up a supernatural doorway for God to intervene. If you're responding in wrath against someone who's irritating against you, then you got what you did. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, right? If someone takes out your tooth and you take out their tooth, done. The score's even. Everything's done. The Word of God gives you the right to do that, by the way. The Old Testament gives you the right that if someone takes out your tooth, you get to take out their tooth. That's legally permissible in the Old Testament. But Jesus came along and said, you know what? I'm going to give you the real intent of that. And so he gave us instruction on how to love one another, how to love with no expectations back. Because when you love without any expectation back, then you open up the supernatural doors of heaven for God now to move in and to do all the correcting for you. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And when you know what, when you feed your enemy and when you give him something to drink, the Bible says you heap burning coals on his head. That should have some satisfaction, right? Okay? You should get something out of that. At least God says that if you're loving them with no expectation back, it's like you're heaping burning coals on their head. That should make some part of our psyche happy. Okay? But that's not the real intent of that statement. In the Old Testament, in some circles, they would actually, when they were in a repented state, would actually walk around with uh, a bowl of hot coals on their head showing that they were repenting. It's just an old world way of doing it, but sackcloth and ashes, things like that. So really what that statement is saying is when you are hurt and then don't hurt back, you're now allowing this, the gates of heaven to open up in that person's life for God to show them goodness and kindness, which always leads men to repent. Becoming a doer of the word. So, if you're struggling in something, struggling in loving people the way you should, struggling in tithing, or struggling in all the different instructions we get as believers, um, and if you're struggling in that area, I understand that struggle. Struggles are real. And this scripture can be used, can be weaponized and hurt people. And I hopefully, I'm de-weaponizing it this morning. If you've ever been hurt by that scripture. Because wherever your weakness is, in God, where you're failing, and you've heard me say this before, and I will say it again and again, your weakness is your golden ticket into the presence of God. The law says if you're weak, you can't come in. If you've got a spot or a blemish, you can't go into the presence of God. He doesn't want that sacrifice. The lambs had to be pure. No spot, no blemish. 
Nothing broken. Perfect. That was Old Testament. New Testament says, perfect? If I waited for perfection, I'd get none of you. <laughs> that was supposed to be funny. There we go. I knew you'd catch up with me. All right. Because there's none of us perfect. And it's your spots, it's your wrinkles, it's your brokenness that is your golden ticket into the presence of God because he's waiting for you to come in so he can fix it. He's waiting for you to come in to let him fix it. Yes, we're supposed to become a doer of the word. If you're just a hearer only, you're going to get self-deceived. But I doubt that any of you are that bad of doers. Doers don't show up on Sunday morning. I mean, hearers only don't necessarily only show up on Sunday mornings. I'm trying to make you feel good. I'm not saying it right, but I bet you're doers for the most part. Yeah, there might be a few of you. But now every one of you is thinking, yeah, that's me. That's why I don't want to talk that way. Because our super psyche takes over and say, hey, you, you lower psyche, see how bad you are? Yeah, okay. God's so funny how he does things. So, what does a doer look like? Someone who lets the word of God come in. Now, the one thing you have to remember is you have already have God writing on your heart. Hebrews chapter 10 says that God is writing his laws on your hearts and in your minds. So you already have God writing in your heart. So you already have God as you, you spend time with him. But then we go to the word and we get, we're renewing our minds. So there's transformation in our lives, right? We renew our minds. But we need to make sure we understand that rest policy. Go to sleep by night, rise by day, and just start doing your day with the word in mind. And let God make the changes. There are some scriptures that are very important that back this up, I think. Philippians 2.13. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. Will you allow him to do that? Let him work in your heart to, to create the desire and the ability to do it. Let him work in you. First, uh, 2 Corinthians 3.18, but we all looking, and this is in the Darby translation, but we all looking on the glory of the Lord with unveiled face are transformed according to the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. As we look into that law of liberty, we can expect God to begin to transform us into the way we need to be every day. Proverbs 4, 20, 20 to, to 23, my son, give attention to my words, incline your ears to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes, but keep them in the midst of your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to all their flesh. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it, the earth, out of your heart, the earth, out of the heart, the earth, springs the issues of life. Why did I focus on that? Because if we go back in verse 28 of Mark 4, it says, For the earth yields crops of itself. The earth is your heart. As you put the word in, then that word mixes with the new creation that God already put in you, and it starts to produce. In 2013, I discovered myself in a position that was not good. It was dark. I had taken on the word in such a degree that it was a bag of bricks. In my own personal life, I became so legalistic on how I was approaching the word of God. Every message I heard was another brick in the bag. I was just not doing it right, and there's no way that God was going to bless me ever. And 2013 was a year full of things that proved that to be true in my mind. God took me to a place where he helped me just rediscover the presence of God. 
where I began to sit in the presence of the Lord and do nothing. That's it. I put on some music, I sat, and I did nothing. I didn't open up my Bible, I didn't pray in tongues, I didn't have any other prayers, nothing. I just sat. My purpose was simply to say, God, I don't need to do anything because you're good enough. I'm just going to come and sit with you because you're so good. I just need to spend time with you. And I need to stop trying to show you how good I am. And I kept trying that. That was 2014. This will be, I think, year number six. Um, I have more successes spiritually in my life these past six years than the previous 30 years combined. More things that God has done in my life simply because I learned how to rest. And the way I learned how to rest with this music and just sitting still, now every one of you is going to find a different way of rest. Some people need to be walking. Some people like to be out, you know, walking in the woods or maybe running or however you discover your rest with God. Because you weren't created like me, so don't do it exactly the way. I'll tell you how I did it, but you have to discover it yourself. You can, simply, you can always use my, my techniques with the idea that you will be discovering your own, I guarantee it, once you discover how rich your father is. Your father is so rich towards you, he's so desirous for you just to come in and sit. And as you sit in the presence of God, I guarantee you one thing, you will never sit in the presence of God, not ever going away changed. You will always change. Now, you may not detect it, but there's always something that gets changed. Amen. Always something that gets changed when you just simply rest. With the idea, you know that God is making you a doer. If you try to be the doer on your own without the presence of God in your life, everybody around you is going to hate you. Because I guarantee you, you'll become the doer police. You know what that is, don't you? You'll point out everybody else isn't doing what they're supposed to be doing. So there we are. So you're a doer. Let God make you more of a doer. You're not done being a doer. You're not done growing in that direction. You're, you can be more of a doer than you are right now. That's God's desire and intent for you to do it. But realize, if you're just hearing the word of God, that is a warning in the word of God that that is self-deceiving. So you don't want to be that way. Just say, God, okay, I'm not going to be that way. Help me be a doer. I want to get into your word, and I want it to change me. I want it to be a doer. Our job, scatter the seed. Put the seed in us. Make that a focus. Get the seed in you. You've got to do that. If, you have, if you're a farmer and you've got a, a field and you don't plant any seed, guess what? There's not going to be any harvest. Does that make sense? You've got to have some seed going in. Okay. Second is let the seed do its own job. Let it grow. Leave it alone. Rest. Now, our job is when it ripens, you get to put in the sickle and reap the harvest. And you get to enjoy that blessing on how that works. Now, with that all said, yes, there's things for us to do. You have to decide. Like I was in that position with the worker, I had to decide to start praying for her. That was doing the word. I had to decide to start speaking words of encouragement to her. That was doing the word, right? So you have to listen to the Spirit of God about the situation you're in. Ask him, okay, now God, what do I do here? What do I do in this situation? Talk about growing a relationship with the Holy Spirit. That's a good way. That's a good way to do it. So becoming a doer of the word, not a forgetful hearer, being self-deceived. Doers are blessed in all they're doing. Trust God and his word to make you a doer. 
And remember this, for it's God who is working in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. Submit to him that way and let him start doing the work. Let's everybody stand right now. Prayer teams can come forward. And we'll close in prayer. Get the blood flowing. Been sitting for a while. Heavenly Father, we just give you praise right now. And Father, here we are, all together, gathered together. Your word says right now that wherever two or three are gathered in your name, there you are in the midst. So Father, right now, we just submit to your presence. Thank you, Holy Spirit, as you uh, work in us. You guide us, you lead us, you comfort us, you show us things to come, you speak to our hearts, you move us. Father, right now, I'm just trusting the Spirit of God that anyone who needs to know even more about being a doer, Father, you're just going to speak to their hearts right now. They're going to see it. I'm asking, Father, that the Spirit of God open all our eyes, open all our ears, and open all our hearts that we can see, hear, and do. We just give you praise for that, Father, in the name of Jesus. We have the prayer teams up right now. If you'd like any prayer for any reason, you can come forward. And um, otherwise, you're dismissed. Thank you so much for coming today.